All right, well, welcome everyone to Introduction to VRS High Performance Ducted Heat Pump Systems. This particular course is approved for one hour in continuing ed, uh, specifically LEED AP Homes, um, BPI Non Whole House, Mary Green, uh, AIBD as well, and also AIA HSW, uh, which may make it applicable to your state based design or contractor license. Uh, today, I will be your moderator. My name is Brett Little. And I am the executive director here at the nonprofit, the Green Home Institute. All right, so uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to our presenter today, Mike, uh, to take it away. And uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Brett. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. I know we're having some audio issues, so I'm, I'm leaning as far into the computer as I possibly can. So I'm going to try to talk as loud as possible as well, too. My name is Mike Schaefer. I'm the performance construction manager for Mitsubishi Electric here in the Midwest. So I live outside Chicago and cover 12 states here in the Midwest, central of the country. Uh, what we're gonna go over today is an introduction to high performance ducted heat pump. The session discusses the concept of high performance homes, and buildings and the applications of variable refrigerant flow ducted heat pumps to meet their design and efficiency requirements. It reviews different types of ducted indoor units, the special design considerations associated with them, and how to effectively design for cold climate installations. We have a lot of learning objectives. I want to glance over them here quickly. So first is to define and describe what's meant by the term high performance ducted heat pump explain the different types of ducted indoor units and special design considerations, identify the heating needs for cold climate and how ducted indoor units can meet these, <clears throat> and list the benefits ducted VRF systems provide for the design of high performance homes and buildings. So first off, what really is VRF technology and the benefits? VRF, which is variable refrigerant flow, is an HVAC technology solution that efficiently conditions zone spaces for temperature comfort. This is accomplished through the use of an inverter driven or variable speed type compressor. VRF systems are comprised of a central variable capacity outdoor unit connected to a single or multiple variable capacity indoor units. Since the compressor can vary its speed and capacity, the indoor units can vary their capacity. The system delivers a precise capacity to meet the load in each zone. Traditional compressor systems maintain temperatures by turning on and off, dependent on the set point. This means they're constantly ramping up and down in order to keep the temperature, drawing a maximum energy input each time the system starts. When the system turns off, the set point temperature naturally drifts and is no longer maintained. Traditional compressor systems also employ a constant fan speed to deliver comfort to the entire zone. When the system reaches the set point temperature, the fan shut off. We're all used to this. This is pretty much traditionally how homes are heated and cooled. For a comparable example of how a traditional compressor system works, think about driving your car in stop and go traffic. You accelerate from a stop to a desired speed, and shortly thereafter, you apply the brakes and come to a complete stop. Imagine now that every time you stop the car, you turned off the engine. Some cars are actually doing this now. In order to move with the flow of traffic again, you would have to start the engine. Starting and stopping the engine every time you needed to move the car is really how traditional compressor systems work. Uh, Inverter-driven compressors are different. Upon starting, inverter compressors ramp up to speeds beyond traditional compressor systems in order to rapidly bring the temperature down to the desired set point. Once the set point temperature is reached, fan rotation speed is maintained at low levels. This allows the system to more efficiently maintain the set point temperature without drift and energy consumption spikes. This consistent performance provides dehumidification, reduces temperature stratification of the space, provides consistent filtration of the air, and less system noise. Inverter-driven compressors can be compared to an automobile's cruise control feature. Think about how you would press on the gas pedal to reach the speed limit and then set cruise control. An initial inverter ramp up followed by a steady speed. 
As driving conditions change, hills, valleys, curves, the car's engine adjusts. As temperature drifts occur, the inverter response is needed to hold the set point. In this fashion, the inverter does not need to constantly spike on or off, reducing the overall energy consumption and providing precise temperature control. So what are some benefits to the inverter compressors other than what we talked about? So temperature set points reach much faster. There's a comfortable indoor climate consistently maintained. It eliminates power spikes, you know, that dimming of lights that we traditionally see when a traditional air conditioner kicks on, generates greater heating performance, and energy is used more effectively, meaning that systems can last longer because it eliminates those hard starts and stops. Uh, lead, ver lead version 4.1, so balancing of heating and cooling distribution systems. Because of everything I just talked about with our inverter compressor, it's multi-stage equipment. You can automatically get two points by installing those because that counts as a variable space, variable stage space heating and cooling systems that have more than two speeds. There's way more than two speeds on an inverter compressor. So those would actually qualify for this balancing in, of heating and cooling distribution systems, the multi-stage equipment. So cold climate heat pump technology, how does it actually work? And what kind of heating performance can you expect? Here's a chart showing a traditional air source heat pump heating capacity. Traditional air source heat pumps have been around for a very long time. Historically, they've only been used as primary heating in warmer climates and supplemental or shoulder season heating in cold climates. As we can see from the chart, as the temperature, outside temperature begins to fall, which is the bottom line, the traditional heat pump loses its ability to provide sufficient heat. Traditional heat pumps, whether they are VRF heat pumps or not, should not be used as primary heat source in cold climates. VRF heat pumps, VRF systems do have traditional heat pumps that operate very similar to this, and they have cold climate heat pumps, which we're gonna look at. They really should not be used as primary heat in cold climates. You have to have some form of supplemental heat to actually use a traditional air source heat. On the other hand, cold climate air source heat pumps provide outstanding heating performance, even in the extreme cold. Cold climate heat pumps can maintain 100% heating capacity down into the single digits. They do not begin to lose capacity as it gets colder outside or they do, I'm sorry, they do begin to lose capacity as it gets colder outside. However, the D rate's much less, and they continue to maintain very high levels of heating capability and sub-zero temperatures. So if we look at this chart here, you can see that even all the way at minus 13 degrees outside te ambient temperature, we're still right at about 80% heating capacity with a cold climate heat pump. That's a lot better than a traditional heat pump. Let's take a look at the heating capability of a 24,000, so two ton BTU traditional VRF air source heat pump. As we can see, this heat pump's ability to provide sufficient heat begins to drop off once we get below freezing. I certainly wouldn't want to have this as a primary heat source in my home. I live in Chicago. We are way too cold of a climate to have a traditional air source heat pump to be the primary heating source. Where can we use something like this? Definitely when we get into the warmer climates. Once we start getting, you know, Southern Illinois and, and below here in the Midwest and in the South and in the West and in the Southwest, we can use this. We can also use a traditional heat pump in cold climates as a supplemental heating source. So it can be your heating source in the spring. It can be your heating source in the fall and early winter, but you need to have some form of backup. Now let's look at the heating capability of a two ton VRF cold climate air source heat pump. This heat pump maintains 100% of its heating capacity down to five degrees and still maintains 90% of its heating capacity at minus 13. Please note that these are all ambient temperatures. Wind chill has no effect on the heat pump's performance. So this is all based on a minus 13 outside ambient air temperature which we really don't see that traditionally here, especially around Chicago. I know we do when we get further north of here. 
So what happens if it gets colder than minus 13? The heat pump will continue to operate just at a lower capacity. So I, would, I myself would be 100% comfortable installing this cold climate heat pump as my primary heating source, as long as it's sized appropriately. So as we can see with a cold climate air source heat pump, even when we get into the frigid sub-zero temperatures, we're still providing a significant source of heating. So what makes up a VRF heat pump system and what are ducted indoor units? There we are, kind of skipped out there. Is that a little odd looking? Kind of zoomed in. I don't know if I pressed something different. Hold on a second, one second. It there we go, I'm sorry, that was me. That was my fault, I'm sorry. All right, here we go. A basic single zone VRF air source heat pump has an outdoor unit and an indoor unit. The outdoor unit powers the indoor unit and refrigerant and communication lines connect the two components. The indoor unit can be controlled via a handheld controller, Walmart thermostat, or a Wi-Fi controller as well. A multi-zone VRF air source heat pump, which is the system on the right, has an outdoor unit that can connect to multiple indoor units. The outdoor unit powers each individual indoor unit and refrigerant and communication lines connect all of the components. Multi-zone systems enable a home or building to have individual temperature control and zoning for each space that the indoor unit serves. Each indoor unit is controlled either separately via individual controllers or can be grouped together to act as a single zone. Indoor units come in a variety of designs to fit various applications. The different indoor unit models can be installed in a single zone application or mix and matched in a multi-zone application as well. So the first one here shows a picture just of a register on a wall because that is a ducted, horizontal ducted indoor unit. Then we have a ceiling recessed unit, which can be in two by two cassette style designs, two foot by two foot or there's a new one-way ceiling cassette that Mitsubishi offers. We have, there's the floor-mounted indoor units. These are really good for, you know, knee wall applications or spaces where you don't have the capability to put a high wall unit. The most commonly known indoor unit is the high wall mounted system. This comes in a multitude of different varieties but they all install exactly the same, but this is the most traditional type of VRF indoor unit that you will see is your, is your ductless wall mount unit. And then there's also, also the multi-position air handler, which we're gonna talk about. For the sake of today's presentation though, we'll be focusing strictly on delving into the ducted indoor units. And the different there's three basic types of ducted indoor units. First, we have the horizontal ducted indoor unit. This is a low static air handler, meaning that it's not built to move a lot of air. It has low external static pressure and low CFM, so it is meant to have a limited amount of ductwork attached. This unit's extremely quiet, a very false small footprint, great for serving one or two rooms. The reason that the static is kept low on this that it cannot have a lot of duct work is because it is extremely quiet. And we'll talk about quiet a little bit later, but with it being extremely quiet, the blow around it is not nearly as strong. So we have to keep a very minimal amount of duct work attached to that. We'll talk about duct design on this a little bit, a little bit later as well. Next is a medium static horizontal ducted indoor unit. This air handler has a higher external static pressure and higher CFM, which enables much more ductwork to be attached than the low static unit. This unit's also very quiet and maintains a small footprint, slightly larger than the lower static unit, but still a very small footprint. As you can see, the design is extremely similar. And this is great for ducting whole floors, apartments, small homes. You can run a significant amount of ductwork off of this system, and it still maintains that smaller footprint. How you're able to do this is, we, you know, we've increased coil size, we've increased the blower size, so now we can actually push more air off of this system while still maintaining that smaller pancakes type small footprint 
sign. Lastly, there's the fully ducted multi-position air handler. This indoor unit has high external static pressure and is very similar to a traditional forced air furnace or air handler. It's extremely quiet, not what you'd expect from a fully ducted air handler. It's not like a furnace. This is extremely quiet and is multi-positional. So upflow, downflow, horizontal left and right. Check with the manufacturer. If it's a downflow, you may need a downflow kit. I can't speak to all the different manufacturers, but this air handler is great for ducting whole homes, apartments, and the key is it can be retrofitted into existing duct systems. So if there is already an existing duct system that is in a home and you are going to replace this with a forced air furnace, the fully ducted air handler can go right in its place. It is ducted and installed just like a traditional system. It is literally plug and play with a forced air gas furnace. So how do we design? What about, um, Whoa, so, go ahead. Sorry. Mike, yeah, what about, um, you know, uh, uh, venting or, um, so I'm thinking typical furnaces, they've got that venting, uh, or, um, you know, do you see that you've got to have a larger, um, you know, electrical box? So dependent on what we're doing with the design here, it, it really depends. First off, big savings with not having to worry about a gas line anymore, especially from a new construction standpoint. If that furnace was the only gas appliance in that new construction apartment or home, there's no need to bring a gas line in anymore. So we eliminate the need for a gas line. We eliminate the need for flue venting for your intake and your outtake on a traditional furnace. So there's not only material, but big labor savings on that. If you're looking at new construction from a retrofit standpoint those are normally already there unless you were looking to take you know an 80 percent gravity fed furnace and upgrade that to a 90 percent plus condensing gas furnace you would have to run new flue venting in this case if you replace that 80 percent furnace with a fully ducted air source heat pump an air handler you would not have to update that flue vent you wouldn't need it at all so there's definitely savings on new construction as well as retrofit. From an electrical box standpoint, that depends on the size of your system. The outdoor air, air source heat pump may have the same breaker size as the air conditioner that was there. But when I say it depends is if you are putting on backup electric heat kits or not. That's something we're gonna talk about in the accessories portion. That's optional whether you need them or depending on what climate zone you're in. But if you need to put some backup electric heat kits on that, then you would have to add some extra electrical service. You know, take another breaker, add a little extra electrical to compensate for that electric resistance heat kit. But that's that's an option, and that's not in every install. That's really depending on where this installation is taking place. So, a lot of savings when it comes from flue venting as well as gas line. So, thank you, Brett. So designing with ducted indoor units, how do we do this? There's a lot of different design options. How do we actually integrate these into existing and new construction? So to maximize the efficiency of cooling and heating equipment, design must be part of the home's overall strategy. That's the key. So amount of zones will drive the VRF system design and the type of ducted indoor units that are required. For this exercise, we'll be using this simple floor plan which can be equated to a ranch style home or three bedroom apartment. It's a lot easier than having to look at a two story home. So we'll keep it pretty simple for this exercise. We're gonna look at three different design strategies for this home, all utilizing ducted indoor units. So this first design strategy here is a ducted ductless combination. This is very common when we're dealing with air source heat pumps and new construction. By utilizing ductless indoor units for bedroom two and bedroom three, as you can see, that's the, the wall mount units placed there on the left, and ducted indoor units for the living kitchen area and the master suite, this home now has four individual comfort zones. So why I wanted to show this example, it really depends on how zoned the homeowner wants to be. This is really a fully zoned strategy here. We use the horizontal low static ducted units 
for the living and kitchen area and master suite since the ductwork is very short and controlled. We don't need a high static air handler in this, in this example. These, these units can be hidden in the attic, in the basement, closets, et cetera. Since they're very low profile, we can put these in some tighter spaces. This design strategy gives individual comfort control for all four areas of the home and can be an energy saver by setting back the temperature in spaces when they're not occupied. So this is really the ultimate in zoned comfort right here, this design. We've utilized ductless units for the two bedrooms on the left, limiting the amount of ductwork we need in the space. And then we're able to utilize the low static horizontal ducted systems, one for the main living and kitchen area to give that a zone and another to zone off the master suite entirely. Now this home has complete temperature control throughout the whole space, still utilizing ductwork. The second example is a two zone fully ducted strategy. In this design, we utilized one horizontal low static ducted unit for the master suite, similar to what was done before, and one horizontal medium static unit for the rest of the home. This gives the homeowner two individual comfort zones and keeps the master suite separate from the rest of the house, allowing precise temperature control in the master suite, and it can be an energy saver by setting back the rest of the home when it's not occupied. This is perfect for an empty nester type scenario where they wanna have control in the master suite and keep that separate from the entire rest of the house. Why I chose in this example to go with these indoor units we need the lower static is perfect for the master suite because the, the ductwork is very short and controlled. Whereas the medium static is really required for that second zone, because as you can see, we're taking over much, a much larger space with much more ductwork attached to it. So we can still do this design and give you two zones with that lower profile horizontal ducted indoor unit. The last design here is a fully ducted approach. This design looks at the whole home as a single zone and is laid out similarly to a traditional forced air furnace installation. This design's perfect for a retrofit scenario like I talked about a couple slides before where we're replacing an existing forced air furnace or air handler with a cold climate fully ducted air source heat. Also great for new construction where zoning is not a concern. So it really depends from a design standpoint what that homeowner is looking for. If they're looking for zone control, this solution would not be the best solution. If they're looking for a traditional type installation and zoning is not of a concern, then this is the best solution. So it really depends on what that homeowner wants. The key is asking the questions and seeing, okay, whether the builder, the homeowner, the developer, whoever's building this, what are the key objectives that we're trying to solve here? Is it a comfort issue? Is it, I don't wanna see ductless units on the wall? Do I wanna have separate zones? They're all questions that need to be asked. So next, what are the benefits then of ducted heat pumps for new construction, retrofits, and renovations? First off, I want to look at some levels of home performance. If we're familiar at all with the HERS index, I'm going to talk about that for a minute. So energy consumption represents a measurable value that appears every month in the form of a utility bill. I think we all understand that. The ResNet HERS index is widely accepted as an industry standard by which a home's efficiency is measured. It's becoming a lot more popular. I know we're talking a lot about LEED, but I also want to kind of hit on HERS as well. HERS scores are being used very regularly in new home construction market. It can be thought of the home industry's version of miles per gallon. So one out of three new homes are HERS rated. A rated home is a big selling point. And we're actually using these in MLS property listings now to market a home. So the U.S. Department of Energy has determined that a typical resale home scores 130 on the HERS index. Standard new construction home, that's up-to-date code-built home, scores a rating of around 100. 
if we look at kind of below that and where homes fall, obviously we have an Energy Star home that could fall around 60. You have a 50, a score of a 50, which means that that's 50% more efficient than a standard home, 80% more efficient than an average resale home. So big energy savings based on the score. You get down to a 30, that's around a passive home level, very, very energy efficient. And then a zero is the net zero home. That means that it produces enough energy through renewable resources as it consumes. So the zero energy home is kind of the ultimate goal. Can we go negative on a HERS score? Yes, we can. That's if you're implementing enough renewables, be that solar, wind, whatever it might be, that you're producing more energy than you're actually consuming. So employing ducted air source heat pumps to heat and cool a high performing home helps to lower the HERS score. The biggest impact on a HERS score, and I know we're talking about ducted indoor units, is actually utilizing ductless indoor units. That's going to have a significant impact on the HERS score. We've done modeling. We've seen this by eliminating the large duct systems that will dramatically reduce the HERS score. Even going back and looking at that hybrid ducted ductless design will help lower the HERS score as well because we're minimizing the amount of duct work that we're using. So that actually has a significant impact on improving that HERS score. This is the next slide here. Let him hop on. Yeah, so I just wanted to jump in real quick um, and mention the fact that, uh, you know, some of the projects we've been looking at on um, kind of a one-off basis, um, especially up here in colder climates, uh, if, you're if you're utilizing the HERS index rating and RES ResNet software or any software um, for uh, heat pump systems, all electric systems, there typically actually can be uh, just a straight up energy penalty um, when trying to you know, look at a 98% you know, efficient natural gas system uh, versus an air source heat pump or even the ground source heat pump system on the HERS index uh, number itself. Now, interestingly, if you peel back the layer, you'll always typically find the projected energy costs and usage is a lot lower. But um, the actual HERS number itself, which is how you get lead credits, is, is in, and again, this is very subjective on every property, but on a lot of we've looked at, um, there actually, in many times, there was a, a, a small penalty um, if, you would have, if we would have thrown in a gas furnace. Um, so a couple of things. Um, first of all, it's good to know that uh, the performance pathway the HERS index rating is being used on most projects now. And under the new V4.1 single family homes rating system, they're actually getting rid of the uh, prescriptive pathway entirely. And you'll only be able to do uh, performance. So there is a new option now called the uh, lead energy budget. And you can go to the USGBC's website and read up on that and watch a little video. But the whole idea of this is you're kind of looking at a baseline home uh, energy use per year, and then you're stacking it up against your project. Um, and you're looking really at that sort of energy use per year number rather than some kind of HERS rating. Um, and so we found that a lot of times uh, smaller homes um, do better using the energy budget. And also we found um, homes that are uh, all electric uh, actually fare a lot better uh, using this alternative pathway. And so when you're in REM rate, you can pull a report called the LEED V4 report, and that's where your energy rater will get you the data you need um, for, uh, for that. So thanks. Thank you, Brett. Thanks for explaining that. So what are some benefits for new construction? Easy to install, less time. This goes back to what I explained earlier about no gas line or flue venting work required. That can be, you know, it's, it's not that huge of a material savings when you think about it, gas line and flue venting work. But when you start getting into the labor to do all of that, that can be a really big savings. Ducted indoor units are hidden, so they're not an aesthetic objective. That's one of the most common objectives that we get about our wall mount units from an aesthetic standpoint. Traditionally here in the U.S. market, we're just not used to that. So it's something that they tr really don't want to look at. 
ducted into our units are great to solve that problem because they're completely hidden. They're just, especially if we look at our full, fully ducted air handlers, they're just like a traditional ducted HVAC system. So to the homeowner, there's gonna be differences in comfort, differences in energy usage. However, differences in aesthetics, there's nothing. It's gonna be exactly what they're used to seeing. Uh, zone comfort provides cooling and heating where needed. So that talks back to the different designs, how zoned we wanna be. We can provide precise cooling and heating where we need it at in the home. Extremely energy efficient with very high SEER and COP ratings. While this is an all electric air source heat pump, people think electric heat and they immediately think to how much it costs to run electric resistance heat, whether that is electric resistance heat kits on a traditional air handler or electric baseboard heat. This is not like that. These are extremely high COP ratings, and very energy efficient. All electric air source heat pumps, so no need for fossil fuels. If we're looking to eliminate fossil fuels or eliminate at least having fossil fuels in the home, this is really the solution for that. We're able to give you the heating and the cooling that you need without the need for fossil fuels. And then quiet, once again, extremely quiet, both indoor units and outdoor units as well. Extremely quiet system. So what are some benefits then for retrofit and renovation? The multi-position air handlers can be easily retrofitted into existing duct systems. So very similar footprint to a traditional forced air system. This is key in retrofitting and renovations for homes as well as multifamily projects. Extremely energy efficient with high SEER and COP ratings, just like I explained before. You have a multifamily building that is heated with electric resistance heat. This is much, much better solution for that. All electric air source heat pumps, once again, no need for fossil fuels. Perfect for retrofitting all electric multifamily buildings. Electric resistance heat kits can be added to air handlers for backup or supplemental heat. I'm gonna talk about those in the accessories, but like I explained before, depending on what climate zone you're in and how cold it gets, you may need to put in some electric resistance heat kits for supplemental or emergency backup heat. It doesn't mean they're going to be utilized, or they may be utilized a very small percent of the time, but it's not bad to have them there in the extremely cold climate. Then much quieter than traditional forced air systems. Think about it from a multifamily application. I think anyone that can ever attest to living in an apartment or a condo of any sort, it's extremely noisy, a traditional HVAC system in a very small space like that. You hear it kick on, you hear it run, you have to turn up the television if you're watching television. They're extremely noisy systems. With, our, with air source heat pumps and fully ducted air handlers, they're much quieter than traditional systems. We talked about some benefits and everything else to that, but there's certain things we need to keep in mind when installing ducted heat pumps. Access panels, clearances, required space, are all things we need to take into consideration. So if we look at our horizontal ducted units, the ceiling basement or mechanical room space is gonna be required. Obviously we have to put this indoor unit somewhere. In a new construction scenario, that's very easy to do. If you have a basement or you have an attic space, and I'm gonna talk about thermal envelope, that is also very easy to put this unit in. I've done a lot of new construction homes where we may drop the ceiling in the master closet and place this there. And then now we don't have to drop the ceiling for the rest of the floor for the ductwork. Serves one to two rooms close to the unit. So low static system, like I talked about before, we wanna make sure from a design scenario that we don't plan on ducting a whole house or a whole floor to lower static system. Multiple rooms are gonna be on the same zone. So that means if you're putting a horizontal ducted unit to take care of two or three bedrooms, we have to understand that those rooms, even though we're a zoning system, those rooms are gonna be on the same zone. So if we want individual zone control, we have to look at doing a little bit of a different design. Service access panels needed if there's not an attic or a basement. So like I said before, placing this and dropping a ceiling in a master closet, there needs to be an access panel or something to get to the unit to service it if needed. Here's some clearances. I'm not gonna burn through this. This is all in installation manuals if you want to look at it, but just kind of showing the distances we need around a unit like this. 
it can be fully recessed. We just have to make sure that you have access to get to the service side piece of the equipment. I've seen it before where somebody may look at a, a unit like this and see how small of a footprint it actually is, but then not leave enough space for, for access for servicing, which then you have to tear out ceiling or tear out a tear out a joist or something else. We don't want to do that. So we want to make sure we pay attention to the service requirements when we're installing these systems. Then if we look at the fully ducted air handlers, now you're pretty much used to what you would need for something like this as it's very similar to a furnace. So mechanical room space is required for a unit like this. So you do have to have an attic, a basement, mechanical closet, somewhere to put this unit. It serves large areas or whole homes. So we can do an entire home off of one fully ducted air handler. Once again, like the lower static unit or the horizontal units, whatever is connected to this is going to be on the same zone. So we have to keep that in mind. Mechanical ductwork system options are available. So we can add, you can add on a humidifier, air cleaner, ERV, different accessories to the systems just like you do to a traditional forced air furnace. From a clearance standpoint, they're virtually identical to that of a forced air furnace. I think everyone can relate to the clearances that you're going to need. Big benefit to it though, you're not gonna have gas line having to come into the side of it, and you're not gonna have blue flu vent have to come off the top of it. So you actually have some smaller clearances with our systems from the sides and above because you don't have the flu venting and the gas line to worry about. Inside the thermal envelope, this is something that gets overlooked a lot. It's a part of a lot of codes now. But keeping ductwork and the HVAC equipment inside the thermal envelope of a home or building is pivotal. When ductwork is located in an uninsulated attic, problems are sure to arise. Condensation can be created due to the large temperature differential of the attic space and the hot, cold metal ducts. Condensation leads to mold, which is never a good thing. Also, ductwork, no matter how well it's sealed, will inevitably leak at some point. Leaky ductwork in an attic space can lead to particulate, contaminant infiltration, and extreme, and extreme energy loss. The only time ductwork or equipment should be located in an attic space is when the attic space is fully encapsulated. That means making it inside the thermal envelope. So <clears throat> when I say attic space for a unit, I never really ever want to see ductwork, even if it's insulated, or mechanical equipment located in an uninsulated attic space. It's just ripe for problems, you know, especially the condensation issues, as well as particulate infiltration and a big energy loss as well. That's where when I talked about the HERS score before of how ductless systems really do lower that HERS score, it's because of eliminating ductwork. So if we can minimize it or install it correctly, ductwork's great. Compact duct design. With today's tight envelopes, there's no need to take the ductwork to the exterior wall anymore. This is a very hard concept to understand. I, I get that, but it minimizes the need for large ductwork systems. So using compact designs can make it easier to keep ducts and equipment inside the thermal envelope. I wouldn't suggest this method in older or leaky homes since all of your thermal loss is at the outer walls but in new construction of a high performance, very energy efficient, tightly built home, you don't have that significant thermal loss at your outer walls or your windows anymore. So there's no need to push that ductwork all the way out to the outer wall. Retrofitting, non-energy efficient or leakier homes, don't do this. Still do it the traditional way, but in high performance homes, there's a way to minimize that ductwork compact duct design. Another way is, you know, modifying your truss. So changing your truss design in a new construction home or remodel is another way to keep everything inside the thermal envelope. By raising the truss in a hallway, you can allow space for ductwork in the horizontal ducted indoor unit without sacrificing ceiling height. If you're able to do this, this is a great solution, keeping everything inside the thermal envelope. Then you don't have to worry about encapsulating that attic. Low static ducted indoor units require special considerations when it comes to duct design. We could spend all day going over duct design. So to keep it simple, we need to follow the same duct sizing rules as we would for a fully ducted air handler, 
keeping the lower external static pressure in mind. Duct design is accomplished by doing a manual D, which is duct design for static pressure and CFM flow, and manual T, which is termination design for duct grills calculation. Duct design can be challenging, and it's often where problems arise. The biggest problem I see with our lower static ducted units is when a contractor does not take in the lower static into account with their duct design. They're not used to it. They may size it. I've seen misapplied low static ducted units where it's ducting an entire house and they're wondering why it's not heating or cooling properly because it doesn't have the CFM or the external static pressure to do it. That's the amount of air that needs to be. So really duct sizing is a very, very pivotal thing that we need to keep in mind with these lower static systems. Here's a snapshot of a basic duct design for a low static ducted unit. And if we look at the notes on here, total duct length should be less than 50 feet. That's just a rule of thumb. The, to the use of hard duct pipe is recommended. Why is the use of hard duct and pipe recommended? Much better airflow and less restriction than flex duct. Flex duct when installed properly is good, but it's not usually installed properly. So I always recommend the use of hard duct, metal pipe. Use of minimal number of elbows. Keep the elbows limited as much as possible. And just keep, just keep everything as, as, as slim, as compact, as short duct runs as possible. You have to keep everything in mind when you're dealing with a lower static unit. It cannot be ducted like a traditional system. So please keep these considerations in mind. It can really make a correctly applied system not work properly if that ductwork design is not correct. So there's many accessories that can be added to a ducted heat pump, such as humidifiers, air cleaners, dehumidifiers. They can all be easily integrated. For this presentation, I want to focus on electric resistance heat kits and ventilation. So first, I mentioned it a couple times earlier, the electric resistance heat kit. They can be installed directly on a fully ducted air handler. So they're meant to fit right on top of, an, of a fully ducted air handler. They're used for emergency backup heat or to make up supplemental heating BTUs on extremely cold days if needed. So from a sizing scenario, so say you needed more heating BTUs than that air source heat pump can provide, the heat kits can add a supplemental heating BTUs to the system. They run in conjunction with the cold climate heat pump, and they can be engaged based on outdoor air temperature or a drop at indoor space temp. There's multiple ways to control an electric heat kit, and it's making sure that we control it properly. Because we want to limit the amount of runtime that an electric heat kit has. Why? It costs a lot to run electric resistance heat, like I explained earlier. It's like running electric, electric baseboard heat. While they're 100% efficient, they have a COP of one, they cost a lot to operate. So we wanna minimize or eliminate the need to run these, but in extremely cold climates, we get up you know, northern Wisconsin and, and Minnesota and the Dakotas and other areas, you need some form of backup heat, even with a cold climate air source heat pump. So by having something like an electric heat kit on there, you're covered. Uh, Third-party inline duct heaters, can also be used with horizontal ducted indoor units. Just check with your contractor, your distributor, somebody first on compatibility. Want to make sure we apply the right product for that. Ventilation. Fresh air can be brought directly into ducted indoor units to meet ventilation requirements. ERVs and HRVs can either be fully decoupled from the VRF system, definitely the preferred method. I'm going to show a couple pictures here or ducted directly into a ducted indoor unit. Here's an example of an ERV that it's ducted into a fully ducted air handler. The ERV supply ties directly in the HVAC duct system. I prefer to have it go into the HVAC supply for various reasons. We can talk about that offline if anyone wants to talk about that. And the ERV return pulls exhaust from other areas of the home. So this just kind of shows an example, and you can do this on the horizontal ducted system of, as well, of tying in that ventilation into a ducted heat pump, into a ducted indoor unit. Here's an example of a fully decoupled ERV system that's not tied into the HVAC system, HVAC system at all. 
it has its own supply and return air ductwork that that is exchanging the home's air independently from the HVAC system. I always prefer decoupling the ventilation from the heating and cooling system if possible. That that way there there's no mixing between the two. Nothing is affecting the other. So you're not bringing in ventilation air into a duct system that now has to overcome some additional static. You don't have to worry about integrating the fan systems to run together. It's a lot simpler to do that. However, incorporating an ERV into an existing duct system is less labor intensive because you already have that duct system there in presence. So you have benefits of both. I prefer decoupling it entirely, but that's the other way is, is totally plausible as well. Um, another one of the lead credits we can talk about is the installing of quiet space heating and cooling systems. I've talked about it repeatedly, about how quiet ducted indoor units are. And this is saying that in each room, achieve maximum background noise levels from heating and cooling systems to ensure they are at or below the following thresholds. So they're requiring 35 decibels or less for living areas and 40 decibels or less for kitchens and baths. Ducted heat pumps generally run somewhere in the range of 23 to 40 decibels. And that's actually, uh, you know, the 23 is on a low fan speed and the 40 would be on a high fan speed. To meet this requirement, you can actually rate them and measure them on low fan speed. And that ducted heat pump 23 to 40 decibels is measured right at the unit. And for the lead requirement, they actually measure them in the room. So it's going to be substantially less than 23 to 40 decibels for the living areas. So a ducted indoor heat pump unit is easily going to meet this requirement for lead point. In summary here, cold climate ducted heat pumps can provide exceptional heating performance in cold climates. We showed that at the beginning with the charts. They maintain high heating capacities, even in sub-zero temperatures providing year-round comfort. Ducted heat pump systems include an outdoor condensing coil, an indoor ducted unit, refrigerant piping, and a controller. Multi-zone systems can have a variety of indoor units, ducted or ductless, mix and match, connected to a single outdoor unit. A manual D duct design must be performed to determine the proper ductwork system for a ducted indoor unit. Special consideration should be paid towards duct design for low static air handlers. I can't stress that enough that the low static air handlers are not plug and play type systems. You have to take that lower static into special consideration with your duct design. Whereas the fully ducted air handlers are plug and play for traditional duct systems. High performance ducted heat pumps integrate with the architectural and aesthetic design of new and existing homes and buildings, their efficiency, cold climate performance, and zone temperature control makes them a perfect fit for new construction, retrofits, and renovations. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the time on here. I hope everyone could hear me correctly. I know we're having some audio issues. This is my contact information. I am based out of the Chicago area, and I do cover the Midwest. So if you have design questions, if you have you know, new homes, retrofits, multifamily applications that you want some assistance on, you want me to help you with, please let me know. That's my goal. I'm here to work on new construction, retrofits, and renovations. So I can connect. If you're a builder or an architect, I can connect you with the appropriate contractors to install these systems, anything that you might need. But Please take my information down. Never hesitate to get a hold of me. I can talk to you a little bit more in depth about the duct design or ERV integration, anything that you may have questions on. Greatly appreciate your time. Hey, thanks, Mike. Um, we got some time here for questions, and there are a lot coming in. But uh, as those are coming in, and feel free to keep putting more in, uh, just a real quick Huge thanks to um, our board of directors, our volunteers, all of you for joining us and supporting us, all of our members. Big thanks to our top, top tier sponsors, uh, Shrinergy, who has both on the go and within your home or office uh, microgrid solar 
battery backup solutions um, for everything you can think of, uh, camping, home office, everything. Uh, and then, of course, a T-stud, uh, structurally insulated framing systems. They're insulated studs that can basically be used for all stud assemblies. 2x6, they're launching a 2x8, confirmed an R22 uh, in the wall stud assembly to help keep cost down versus exterior insulation. And then, of course, uh, Mitsubishi Electric, um, ducted, ductless, and BRS systems for all your electric heat pumps and net zero needs. Um, so yeah, Mike, there's a lot of questions coming in. I guess one real simple one is um, just, you know, how many uh, manufacturers do you know about there that are making these uh, sort of quote-unquote non-traditional heat pumps? There are a lot of manufacturers out there now that are actually uh, you know, Mitsubishi is not the only one by any means. Yeah. We we were really the first to bring out that fully ducted air multi-position air handler. So that is something that, you know, that we've really brought to the market as well as the, uh, the sheer amount of ducted indoor unit options and that cold climate heating capability. But, I mean, I can't put a number on how many manufacturers there are now. Ask me, you know, four years ago, I could have told you there's six or seven. Now, th there's... And I can't even say that there's that many different manufacturers. Mitsubishi is one that manufactures a product for Mitsubishi, but there's a lot of other brands that are Chinese labeled products. So that's just something to keep in mind if you're looking at it. Looking at energy efficiency or um, SEER, EER, HSPF rating, you know, what kind of ratings are we seeing for these types of systems? Like, what kind of range of, uh, of ratings? If we look at, let's, let's take a look at, say, that um, the single zone fully ducted air handler system, which is, you know, probably the key to the presentation here. They're extremely high efficiency. You're looking, some, you know, you're looking in the range of, uh, you know, 16 to 16 to almost 18 SEER from that standpoint on a system. So that's equivalent to a very high efficiency traditional system. EERs, you know, around 12, HSPS of 11. And you have COPs. COPs range then, you know, depending on the outdoor air temperature because they're air source heat pumps. But those range usually between about one and a half to three and a half, almost four from a COP standpoint. So very, very efficient systems. Um, may, I don't know if you can elaborate this a little bit more, but how would you compare ducted systems versus non-ducted multi-head with ceiling cassettes? The, 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 the true difference is what you're looking for. It's really zoning versus non-zoning. So if you are going to install ducted indoor units, unless you're, and I, and don't get me wrong, I did a house here in Chicago that has 11 ducted indoor units. So it's not that you can't zone with ducted indoor units. It's just not as realistic or you're limiting the amount of zones that you're utilizing. So if you really want to zone a house from an installation standpoint as well, get rid of ductwork completely, then a ceiling cassette or a wall mount solution is a great solution. You can put units in maybe not every room, depending on the size of the rooms. There's different design strategies I can help with on that. But you can zone your house a little bit better with ductless indoor units. And from a labor standpoint, if we're talking new construction, adding this in, you're not messing with ductwork at all. So it can be a bigger labor savings going with ductless as well. Um, so I know the more commercial and, and maybe multi-family based VRFs allow you to do uh, sort of strategic heating and cooling of a building in, in different aspects. Uh, is that doable on these smaller um, residential systems? So currently, no. How, and, and really, really the question, and I say, I say this, but l let me back up a little bit. There's really not one from a residential single phase standpoint a product that could do simultaneous heating and cooling like three-phase BRF, the Mitsubishi City Multi Equipment can do, meaning one outdoor unit can do heating and cooling at the same time. Now, while a single outdoor unit can't do that, it's all about your design on the house. 
I really prefer to design a home if it can be done and if it's reasonable with single zone systems versus a multi-zone system. You get better turndown ratios, especially in high performance homes. So take a two-story home, for example, instead of having one outdoor unit connected to say two indoor units, one on each floor, mm -hmm. let's separate. Let's put a single zone system for the first floor, single zone system for the second floor. Now you have even higher efficiencies. We're talking Sears, you know, in the 20s and 30s and better turndown ratio. And now you can have heating and cooling simultaneously on each floor. So there's ways around that single phase heat recovery, which is that simultaneous that equipment's coming. It's just not currently available yet. And somebody was asking, do you, do you know that turndown ratio? Yeah, so if, if you're looking from a sink from a, if you look at a single zone standpoint, you could have, you know, just say a 9,000 BTU indoor unit or on a single zone system that can turn down to 1,200, 1,600 BTU. Whereas a multi zone system, it gets larger on the outdoor unit that cannot, cannot ramp down that far. So you're going to be more around the you know, 6,000, 8,000 in terms of a ramp down. So the turn down ratio on a single zone system is much better. So in a high performance home where you need very minimal heating and cooling, that turn down on a single zone system is much more efficient. Um, can you put in the air handler uh, in conjunction with a wall unit or low medium static unit? Yes, absolutely. So on a multi-zone system, it's all mix and match. So you could do that, and we do this a lot. You could do that fully ducted air handler to take over the whole house, connect that to an outdoor multi-zone unit, and then just connect another zone off of the same outdoor unit to say the home office, and put a wall mount unit in there because you're working at home all day and you can have individual control in that space. So yes, absolutely, you can mix and match in for you. Um, so there was a lot of discussion here on the, um, uh, the piece you put out about uh, uh, ductless systems um, performing better in the HERS rating. Um, yeah. I actually went out and looked up real quick on homeenergypros.org um, from 2015. There's this really good dialogue about that. Um, sure, it's still relevant today. So I posted that in there, and I'll share that link with everybody. But I don't know um, if you can elaborate uh, any bit more on on that concept or that idea. The you know, we we had we had a third party do do some modeling for us a while back, and we're going to have more done as well too. But a lot of that was taking just one traditional code built home and changing nothing but the mechanicals in the house, and going from a Still, go, you know, utilizing all electric on this home, but going with a traditional heat pump system and fully ducted and changing it from that to our fully ducted system, it incre it lowered the HERS score just because our efficiencies were higher from an all electric standpoint. Remember this being an all electric home and then taking that system away and putting in our ductless it dropped the HERS score more, even significantly. It was almost like a, like a 15 point drop from that traditional system because we eliminated the duct work altogether. So it took out all of that duct loss and now we're dealing with ductless, which from any energy efficiency rating, it's inherently higher with the ductless units than it is with ducted units. They're just, they're more, they have higher C ratings and higher efficiencies. So we only, not only could you get an efficiency increase going ductless, but you also eliminated those large duct systems. So that's where those, that lowering the points in the HERS score came. That would be traditional, and that's not a, it's a, Mitsu, that's not a Mitsubishi specific, thing. that would be traditional. To, you know, and did you try um, moving, I mean, when you did that study, did you try moving the house through different climate zones to see if that tweaks anything? Yeah, and actually they did it in, the modeling was done in, I'm trying to remember, Boston, Atlanta, and Phoenix. So it was a drop in all of them, just oh, okay. how substantial it was with whatever market. 
But nothing done up in uh, like Chicago or Minneapolis no, or anything. There wasn't anything with with that modeling that was done. But hopefully the next round, yeah, we're gonna get we're gonna get yeah more climate zones in and more areas in. Okay. Um, so there's some discussion here on just accessibility. Uh, some specific questions. Um, you know, what about between joist one-sided ceiling units for service? Yeah. So we have. Mitsubishi has a one-way ceiling cassette now that is meant to fit in on 16 on center standard joist spacing. The beauty to that is, first of all, it'll fit. And from a retrofit, it's easy fit. From a new construction, it's an easy fit. And then there's no access panel needed for that anymore. The whole panel drops down and you can access everything from below. Your connections, your electrical, your drain line, everything is accessible right below. So that, that's our newest product, and it's really a game changer when it comes to indoor units. Takes that aesthetic objection off the wall from ductless standpoint, still eliminates the need for duct work, and now you don't have to have an access panel or an attic space to service the unit. Right. Um, and so they can be placed vertically in a closet uh, if access is, is, is provided, like a utility room? Not vertically, like, or, or how are we talking? The um, you talking the ducted indoor units or that ceiling? Is that? Uh, oh, the whole house uh, units, yeah. Yes, yeah, it, yeah. It can be put into into a into a closet. Absolutely. Yeah, into a mechanical closet. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, that one picture I showed with the ERV tied into that air handler, that's in a mechanical closet. So the comment here is. I have concerns with filter maintenance on ducted units hidden above ceilings or closets. Do you have a recommended a remote filter return grill to promote filter maintenance? And, um, and then I think you addressed this, but do you and do the low static horizontal units have enough fan static to overcome? There, there are certain uh, MERV ratings we have to look at on that. We can, you know, look in the installation manual, but. You, can, you can't put a super high efficient filter on the lower static units. You obviously have to keep it at a certain recommendation and it will tell you that in the installation manual. It may come, the, the horizontal units come with a cleanable filter in that. When you get it, take it out, throw it away. Don't use that because yeah, no one, no one wants to get into an attic. No one's ever gonna get into an attic to change to clean a filter. So you have to put a filter grill somewhere. You know, whether that be a centralized filter grill I've seen applications where contractors have split up the return say it's doing two bedrooms and they put two smaller filtered return grills in the bedrooms so it's a matter of just ch dropping down an access that's in the ceiling and changing those filters right there it's in a basement you're a little bit more apt to change it to change the filter but if you put a horizontal duct unit in an attic or buried in a ceiling you have to put a, re a filter to return grill somewhere. Don't rely on somebody getting up there to change the filter. Um, going back to, and clearly you you made it apparent that you prefer ERV or um, ERVs or HRVs to be um, disconnected, right. decoupled. Um, but if they were coupled, um, you know, uh, what other concerns are there with uh, the fans competing? and then uh, including exhaust fan from the bath in the scenario so first off if you're going to tie and this is this is my recommendation we've had i'm not the ventilation expert i have a counterpart that is a ventilation expert but um from what we've learned here over time if we're going to tie in an erv into a ducted system regardless of the indoor unit i highly recommend tying that erv supply into the supply Fly of the ducted system. There's a couple reasons for that. Is let's say that the ERV is calling, is providing supply air. Then ERV CFM is inherently pretty low. They don't push a ton of air. If you think of your your standard ERVs, right? Not your not the serves or the vendors or the couple systems, but your standard ERVs. They don't push a ton of air. So you need some fan assistance to move that along. If you don't have fan assistance, say for whatever reason that fan is not on at that ducted indoor unit, it's turned off, whatever it might be, 
and you bring that ERV supply into the return, now that fan has to overcome a filter, the coil, a lot of other external static pressure to force that supply air all the way through the filter and the system and the coil and drive it up into the system. So that's one reason. The other reason in a return is temperature issues. I, I don't, it, it would, we could have another 20 minutes of getting into this, but with VRF systems, you could have a hot or a cold coil, even if the system isn't calling because of excess refrigerant bleed off. So, and I've seen this in high performance homes. I've seen an example right here in Chicago that this was a problem why they were overheating the space because the, the ERV supply was dumped into the return. Meaning that that fan was running over a hot coil even when that indoor unit wasn't calling for it. So the ERV fan was basically acting like the indoor unit fan and blowing hot air into a space when it didn't need it. So I recommend dropping it into the supply but if you do drop it in a supply, you can't bring that supply ERV air directly into the supply. There's a method called injection port method, which is basically then putting picture like a 45 of a 45 degree elbow from the supply, ERV supply into the duct system so that it's driving it down upstream, downstream or whatever stream I'm trying to say, but in, in the same airflow direction that the supplier is going. You don't want to dump it right back in because then, yes, you're going to have competing airs going at each other. You have back drafting problems and things of that sort. So if you put it in a supply, which I recommend, direct that so it's going with the flow of air and you don't have competing issues. When it comes to bath fan exhaust, I, once again, it's preference, right? You can tie bath exhaust into an ERV. It's very commonly done. We've seen that bath exhaust or kitchen exhaust can have an effect on the lifespan of an ERV core just because you're introducing some additional contaminants. What that actual impact is, I can't say. But so if we can exhaust a bath fan independently, that's great. If not, it, it's done a lot tying it into an ERV. Uh, keeping that idea going, um, you know, two things kind of here. Um, you know, how does how can these systems uh, connect with smart ventilators like Serve? Um, and also, I just wanted to throw out there. I knew, I know of somebody experimenting on an idea of an actual ERV system or maybe HRV to be the air um, distributor, um, the only air distributor for a ducted heat pump system. Um, so I don't know if you've ever seen anything like that or are looking into anything like that, but could you kind of speak to those a little bit? I, I, that's great you say that. I mean, I don't, obviously we don't have anything currently right now, but I know that you know ventilation is a big thing. Yeah. Especially with the way construction is going and the tighter they are, ventilation becomes more important than heating and cooling. In these structures so being able to integrate those together in the future I, that's where every, that's where it's going i know that you know that's where the market's going it really will be hvac and not heating and cooling and then we think about ventilation or we don't think about ventilation it really will all be tied in together from a control standpoint you know with a with a smart rv like to serve um they can control our equipment we have, they have, I've, I've worked, you know, worked with the folks at Build Equinox. They, they can, they can control our equipment to turn something on when they want to. We can tie pretty much anything into our controls network as well, too. So from a control standpoint, we can, we can easily integrate with each other. It just depends on what you want to accomplish. That's really the main thing. You know, a lot of times that ERV is just completely decoupled from the Mitsubishi system and there's no interaction with them at all. That's completely fine. It just depends on what you want to accomplish in the home. You know, if you want to tie them together, why do you want to tie them together? You know, why do you want to force an indoor unit on at a certain time? Are you going to make that smart ERV control be the runner for everything? Then in that case, we can integrate with that. So it's, it's just really depending on, you know, why you'd want to do something and what the purpose is.
So we've been so focused on heating, we should probably have you just reiterate that these systems are both a two-for-one, right? They're heating and cooling. At, at, absolutely. And I know sometimes we focus so much on cooling that they forget it's for heating and then yeah. vice versa here, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. From a cooling standpoint, extremely energy efficient. You know, I, we, I read off some SEER ratings there. You know, we have ducted systems that are 33 SEER. For, or duct, I'm sorry, ductless systems that are 33 SEER from the efficiency rating. Extremely efficient cooling. It operates the same way. It's all that modulating based off the inverter compressor. So there is that turn down ratio. Everything in cooling is the same as it is in heating from a technology standpoint. We have the ability to be to provide very, very efficient cooling and do a really good job of dehumidification as well, if there if there's a good call for it, you know. So that's one thing I didn't cover when we talk about high performance homes is supplemental dehumidification. We can, you know, that's something that we can cover cover another time if we want, but um, a lot of times with high performance homes, some supplemental dehumidification is required no matter what kind of cooling system you put in that house. Um, back to the sound again, with the short ducted systems and hard ducting, um, are there any potential sound transmission issues? Well, we actually recommend utilizing hard duct, like I said earlier, instead of flex duct, it just helps with the, with the, with the airflow and the static pressure. But from a, from a noise standpoint, I mean, we put we have YouTube videos out there from case studies that we did here around Chicago where we put those systems in sound studios. It's there when I say quiet, it, it's hard to it's hard to really explain how quiet they are because they're so quiet. It's it's not something that that you're used to hearing. I mean, if you look at just say a 9,000 BTU low static unit, that has a maximum decibel rating of 30. You know, it ranges from 23 to 30. That's, I mean, that that's extremely quiet. That's not normally heard of. And the outdoor units themselves, which we don't talk about enough of how quiet those are. I mean, you're talking decibel ratings in the 40s for an outdoor unit. So we have, this is where we do training classes here in Chicago and run the outdoor units in the class and they don't even know that they're running. It's, it's so quiet. They're just extremely quiet. Thanks. Now, uh, last last uh, question here before we wrap up um, on retrofits. Uh, what concerns are there with um, you know retrofitting right into existing ducts in regards to static pressure and you know ducts being buried behind drywall and not being sealed properly? It's it's the same exact concerns you would have if you're retrofitting a new furnace into into an existing duct system we don't know what those ducts look like right so if you have a house that was built in the 80s and it's time to earn the 90s and it's time now to replace that furnace you don't know what that ductwork system looks like either if you're putting a new furnace in there the static is is virtually identical between a fully ducted air handler and a four stick furnace so the static pressure is not a problem it's that unknown of like you said ducts behind walls things of that sort there's technology out there for sealing ductwork that's done, you know, aero seal, some other technology that can help seal ductwork because it is, it's a big unknown. But we run the same risks of retrofitting our air handler into an existing system that you would with a furnace. It's the, it's the, exact, it's the exact same thing. You're going to run into the same potential problems. It's the unknowns of that existing duct system size appropriately when is it installed are there leaks the things that we don't know so adjustments may need to be made just like they would need to be made with a new furnace so nothing is different from that all right um, well Mike I really appreciate your time uh, thanks to Mitsubishi Electric um, thanks to all of you for joining us here we're gonna get wrapped up uh, just real quick where can people contact you if they want to learn more the the best is phone or email listed right there. So M Schaefer, S C H A E F E R at H V A C dot M E A dot com. You can go to our website at meta H V A C dot com or Mitsubishi Comfort dot com. That is our customer facing website. So Mitsubishi Comfort dot com.
you want to learn more. All right. Well, hey, thanks again. Take care, everyone. Have a good rest of your week. Goodbye. Thank you.